Welcome to Anatomy of a Strategy. I'm Stephanie Forster. And I'm Tara Hunt. And if you're new here, Anatomy of a Strategy explores the hidden psychology and behaviors that drive marketing strategies. And today we're exploring a very important aspect of marketing, how to broadly change behavior before a crisis. Just a small topic to tackle before our first episode in this new format. Yeah, no big deal. (laughs) When we spoke with our guest, Laura Fitton, the coronavirus was still pre-crisis, so we didn't really bring it up. But what we discovered as we were editing the interview was that there are some strong correlations between the impending climate crisis and the outbreak. Absolutely. I think there's some interesting lessons in here. I think the biggest parallel is with the challenge of communicating the importance of behavioral changes. Definitely. Whether we're asking people to wash their hands or change their consumption patterns, we're witnessing in real time that this is not an easy task. Correct me if I'm wrong, Steph, but the second parallel I drew was in how the dominance of capitalism determines the success of a campaign to change behavior. No, you're absolutely right. And in the case of coronavirus, I think the threat seemed pretty innocuous until a chain of events were presented that showed how its spread would hurt American companies. Mm -hmm. And that's where the difference really started. So first it was Apple announcing on February 17th that they weren't going to meet their quarterly numbers due to the outbreak, which is how horrible. And then you look at the Dow (laughs) average and you watched it steadily fall. Yikes. Yeah, like really fall. And this goes beyond disruption in the supply chain, too, with that Apple thing. Lots of people in early February thought that the Mobile World Congress cancellation was really an overreaction. I remember that. But since then... Pretty much every worldwide conference has been canceled, including South by Southwest. I think it's the first time ever, which is really enormous. It's not just the conferences that are affected by this either. Uh, Definitely not, as we've seen with Italy. This is rippling through the entire travel and hospitality industry as we speak. Airlines are canceling routes due to an extreme drop in demand. Local businesses are prepared for loss of their annual cash influx. Hotels are sitting empty. Airbnb, they just said, was going to be really hard hit, especially Airbnb owners, their speakers, caterers, event planners, rental companies. I could go on and on, but it's a huge ripple effect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Just goes down the line, probably even to us at the end of the day. But I'm sure you're wondering, like, what this all has to do with (laughs) climate change at this point. Well, if you are wondering that, you haven't been paying attention. That sounds ominous. Well, it is ominous, but it is not inevitable. And I think that's what we want to focus on today. We sure do. So let's get to the interview then. So, Steph, what on earth does the coronavirus have to do with climate change? Well, Tara, as we outlined in the intro, there are several parallels to be made here, but let's start with a basic scenario. All right. So you're a biologist and you've been studying climate change for years, maybe even decades. And there's some pretty strong indicators that point towards an impending crisis, one that will wreak all sorts of havoc all over the world. But you have a few barriers to communicating the gravity of this issue. So what are those barriers? I'm so glad you asked. (laughs) Um, Number one is there are no clear signs to non-scientists anyway that this crisis is about to get really real. Mm -hmm. So sure, you can point to all sorts of indicators that affect real people like flooding, uh, increase in destructive weather patterns, devastating fires, etc. But every time you do, there's always a counter narrative that arises, you know, quote unquote, debunks in your theories. So, of course, these counter narratives are usually tied to non-scientific pundits. Which leads to the second barrier scientists face is the rise of fake news, <laughs> right? Which was made possible by our very own beloved democratization of the internet mixed with political agendas powered by money. Woo, say more. So I'm grossly oversimplifying this, but fake news is not a new phenomenon. It's been around in many forms for centuries, but the internet just allows it to travel faster. We are all susceptible to it because of this human flaw that we have baked into our brains called the confirmation bias. Do tell, what is confirmation bias, Tara? Well, in layman's terms, every human more readily accepts information that confirms our existing beliefs and biases and more readily rejects information that questions those beliefs and biases. So, 
when we see an article in our timeline, especially from a friend or family member that says the person we dislike did a bad thing, nasty Hillary or whatever it is, we're likely to agree with m- without much examination. We won't sometimes even click through to read the full article. And then social media on top of that allows us to share that information really easily. So we see a headline that agrees with what we already believe. We press share and we just spread the article to others. Don't they question our sanity? Well, I mean, some of them might. Uh, This is why people fight on the internet, (laughs) right? But here's where trust comes up. You know the saying, with great power comes great responsibility? Ah, yes, Spider-Man. Yes, right. But what Uncle Ben and Spider-Man knew all too well is that people look to leaders and trusted sources to form their own beliefs. So if those leaders and trusted sources are sharing misinformation, well... Well, misinformation spreads, right? So then scientists are up against trying to get people to take something they can't see seriously and to change people's behaviors, which brings up another cognitive distortion status quo bias and fighting against a lot of misinformation. So where does this misinformation come from and who is spreading it? Well, some of the misinformation is politically motivated and there's been lots of evidence that show foreign interests, you know, the Russian conspiracy against the election, have a stake in dividing us. But much of it is actually rooted in the combination of what you just talked about, status quo bias and confirmation bias. So on the other side of the scenario, there are a whole lot of people who don't want to change for various non-nefarious but self-interested reasons. And here's an example. People whose livelihood relies on fossil fuels, mm. for instance, they wouldn't want to have, you know, buy less gas and drive less. Or people whose business practices have to change, which could cost them money in the short term. And even people who are pretty darn comfortable doing what they've been doing forever. Now, it may seem innocuous, but tell me, Steph, if I was to say to you, If you stop eating meat, or at least eat it only half of the week, what would your first reaction be? I mean, I probably wouldn't have believed you. I buy organic and local. I try not to waste. I recycle. Right. Me too. But there's lots of data out there that shows that cutting back on meat consumption will do away with or slow climate change. Yeah, that's right. And a study by Clara, or the Climate, Land, Ambition, and Rights Alliance, that's Clara, said that cutting back consumption to occasional meat uh, would have a huge impact. So they reported that a global shift towards a flexitarian diet would cut greenhouse gas emissions by 56% and would reduce other environmental impacts by 6 to 22%. So that's not a small amount. No, uh, the meat-loving confirmation bias in me, (laughs) however, wants to fight this information tooth and nail. Yeah, me too, but it's science. It's science. And yeah, we're convinced, but we're inside the bubble, right? So according to our guest today, we are not the target market. Yeah, let's hear what Laura told us about this. But one thing I am noticing about the information that's out there, a whole lot of it is really targeted for the person who already decided environmentalism was important to them, the person who feels a driving need to go green, the person who, you know, sees climate and goes, yes, yes, 100%, I want to fight this. And I think that's problematic because that's not yet the entire majority. And the reality is... um, people know about in terms of the experts, right? The people writing these papers, doing the research, they know about things that the average person doesn't really think about. And climate and the economy, the intersection between the two right now is already veering towards this space where economics itself is being disrupted. That was Laura Fitton, the founder of The Enough Company, whose mission is to explain and evangelize market-driven shifts that can bring speed and scale to the climate crisis fight. Hmm. So she has a background in environmental science and policy, as well as technology and communications, which is a great combination for tackling this huge subject. And she's bang on. There is another bubble being created here. Yep. We listen to specific podcasts and read specific articles and follow specific people who set our own social norms. Now, we still have a ways to go to adopt the behavior. Uh, By (laughs) the way, how's that meatless Sunday thing going, Tara? Uh, Not so great. I accidentally had 
bacon last Sunday. <laughs> and I, before I even realized what I was doing, old habits die hard. Don't beat yourself up, Tara. Habits take a while to form. But the point Laura makes is right, is that we need to get out of our bubble if we want real change to happen. So how do people like Laura stop preaching to the choir? Well, lucky for her and for the planet, some very significant things have happened in this past year that are kind of changing the conversation, I would say. Like, as she said, the intersection between climate and the economy is veering towards a space where economics is being disrupted. Jim Cramer has now gone on CNBC and said, look, I'm done with fossil fuels. I don't see those stocks as a place people could make money. Um, there's a lot of, you know, kind of policy and research level discussion of the proper way to disclose climate risk in your financial accounting. And again, brilliant people have been thinking about this for years, but we haven't quite crossed the bubble to where people have it top of mind and they realize this is no longer about maybe I should divest my 401k from fossil fuels because I'm an activist and I want to feel good about that. Maybe it's because you're going to lose that money because those stocks are declining already, right? And it's coming for other sectors too. It's fairly obvious to understand where the coal sector has been impacted by climate. Um, you know, very few banks anymore are willing to fund coal projects. Many insurers are not willing to insure coal projects. And that's, um, by the way, a great way to slow down the building of new coal projects. But that type of market dynamic, that type of impact is going to cross over into every sector eventually. Um, there's so much in insurance, so much in supply chain, transportation. There is no, you know, business as usual itself is in danger at this point. So one of the big changes that big companies are realizing is that long term, climate change is actually financially terrible for them. And I won't talk about whether the fact that they're motivated by their bottom line is a problem or not yet, mm. but it <laughs> appears to be why they're speaking up now versus in the past where they avoided it or would deny it outright. Right. And you even brought up a very powerful piece of recent news, the BlackRock letter to CEOs. Oh, yeah. This was one of those moments I watched unfold and thought... Shit is going to change. <laughs> this is the sign we were kind of looking for, I Ta -da! think. <laughs> Just in case anyone out there didn't hear about this, in February, the highly influential founder and chief executive of BlackRock, Larry Fink, published his annual letter to CEOs at the center of it, climate change. And that's BlackRock, which is the world's largest investor and with something like $7 trillion in managed assets. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, so his annual letters are pretty legendary, and they really do influence other companies to get in line. Um, you know, the saying goes, money talks, right? Mm -hmm. So when he says, and in bold, no less, <laughs> we believe that sustainability should be our new standard for investing— and he goes on to outline that they'll be taking boards to task and exiting non-compliant industries like coal. Well, that's a message that is going to be received. Yeah, that's influence right there, baby. <laughs> Woohoo! Take that, Jake Paul or whoever it is that got the kids uh, talking these days. <laughs> you know, you may be able to sell some bottles of vitamins, but can you claim to make an entire industry disappear, huh, Jake? Should we be celebrating this, though? <laughs> All right. Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah. Not the power of money. No, we shouldn't be celebrating, like, killing in an industry for sure. Black rocks and supreme influence. Yeah, and buzz or sorry, coal. But uh, I'm personally celebrating the fact that the influencer is finally on the right side of this. Yeah, I mean, it's better than him just being like... Screw the world. Drill, baby, drill. Drill, baby, drill. <laughs> Remember Sarah Palin? Mm. Yeah. And Laura sees this as a trickling down beyond the companies who are concerned about losing his investment. Where I do see some hope is that people who are not environmentalists, right, people who are really high up in the world of finance are the ones sounding the alarm this time. And part of the alarm they are sounding is not just Gee willikers, this is the right thing for Earth. It's like, no, this is going to impact your bottom line. Um, there are huge sectors of the insurance industry that have already lost billions of dollars on wildfires, on flooding, on hurricanes. It's going to come slowly that business wakes up. But the reality is, I don't care what kind of business you're running, how small, how big, how localized, it is going to lose money 
because of climate risk at some point. And so the most urgent thing I can say to the people who want to put their head in the sand and continue to ignore this is like, you know, hey, you're, you're working against your own economic self-interest. If you want your pension to exist, then pension funds need to be being very thoughtful in how they avoid climate risk and invest in climate opportunity. If you want to be able to continue to hire the up and coming generations and have them stay at your company and do good work, you're going to have to, as table stakes, have a climate strategy for your company. Again, no matter what business your company is in or what it does. So it seems like we're at a bit of a turning point then. I guess marketing's job is done. Well, far from it. Okay, so let's take stock then. To create a sort of significant movement towards changing behaviors, whether that's for people, businesses, governments, you name it, that will help slow and hopefully reverse the course towards a climate crisis, people like Laura need a few things. First of all, a strong message. And I'd say that there's plenty of science and messages that exist around this subject right now, which is great. Um, Two, she needs a defined audience. And it sounds like Laura knows who she should be talking to and which part of the message will resonate there. And three, a loud and clear path to that audience, which Larry Fink and others are helping with. So what else needs to be done? I think Laura says is best herself. We are all complicit in this. None of us are innocent. And the reality is a huge portion of literally everyone's paycheck is going towards causing the climate crisis. Right. Mm. Right. And, and we've got to look ourselves in the mirror. And I've been going through this process myself. Um, I run an Airbnb on the side. And so one of my first questions as I started digging into this was, well, what would it take to make my Airbnb climate neutral? You know, if I'm going to pledge other people should do this, I should see what's involved. And like just sorting out the light bulbs took me a good 12 hours. And this is a small <laughs> cottage. It's like 1400 square feet. It took you know, most of the light bulbs were like, okay, buy an LED, unscrew the compact fluorescent, donate that to other people. It's on an island. So I was able to work with the food pantry on the island to make sure those comp- compact fluorescents weren't going into a landfill. They were going to help someone else save on their energy bill. I was in a position financially to invest in all the LED bulbs, but even just figuring out for a bunch of really obscure bulbs in different outlets around the house, I had to like do all kinds of forensic work online. And, you know, there should really, oh God, I have so many startup ideas in the space. One of them is climate concierge. Just come in and help somebody make that transition to get rid of their oil heat, look into whether rooftop solar or community solar makes more sense for them, what they can be doing to get themselves personally off the grid. You know, there is a lot. Yeah, most people won't know how to navigate through that. Laura is very motivated because it's her business. As she was talking, I was thinking about my own bulbs, and it just made me feel tired. (laughs) Yeah, and beyond the idea that there are still more messages and audiences and channels to get through for each stage of this massive turning around of the Earth ship, we can't forget about even other barriers, right? The Earth ship. I'm actually just, like, picturing it in my mind, like, trying to steal that. (laughs) Misinformation, yes, still exists from other corners for sure. And I'm actually a little afraid of what's going to happen post-coronavirus. Yes. Speaking of influential money types influencing all sorts of things, Sequoia Capital, which is a Silicon Valley investment firm, see more finance people are getting in on this, Mm -hmm. published a letter calling coronavirus black swan of 2020. A black swan. That doesn't sound good. (laughs) No. They predicted a drop in business activity, disruptions in supply chain and curtailment of travel, which have already come to pass. Mm -hmm. They wrote this before South by Southwest, et cetera, was canceled, and advised taking a look at all sorts of short-term leading indicators, hinting at downsizing and cutting of non-essential spending stuff. Yeah, it sounds like short-term measurements, but that takes the focus off long-term, doesn't it? Yeah, this is what's a little scary. Nobody's going to spend hours and money replacing those light bulbs to avert a future crisis when they go into immediate crisis Mm -hmm. mode. There's a new bias in town. Scarcity bias. <laughs> did you hoard toilet paper, Tara? No, I did not. But I did order individual hand sanitizers for everyone in the office. And these were shipped via Amazon wow. and are individual bottles. So not very environmentally friendly. 
But they smell great. I love these sanitizers. <laughs> they are. <laughs> I'm going to try hard to keep my eye on the on the long term, but there's a lot of things that we do need to take care of in the short term that may not be of interest. Yes. But speaking of the long term, Laura brought up some great resources for our own long term planning that maybe we can distract ourselves with. I don't mean to make this all sound happiness and sunshine because, you know, it's not. It's scary. But I'm very optimistic that a lot more can be done because we know what the solutions are. There's a wonderful website called drawdown.org that has even modeled out um, the top 80 solutions to climate change. And if we invest X amount in them, what kind of ROI would we see? And it's substantial across the board. So, you know, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. There's a lot of people stopping and asking themselves, wow, should I work full time on climate? I have an answer to that, by the way, on enough.co. I have a page called Climate Jobs that really does link to a bunch of resources to help you find dedicated climate jobs. But the whole top part of the page is dedicated to the idea. And again, this came from the podcast. Guest after guest after guest would literally say, pick up a shovel wherever you are and start digging. And so this is the idea that whatever job you have, you can make it a climate job, right? And it could be, maybe you're starting small. Maybe you work at a huge company and there's no way to compost during the day. So you, you have the leftovers from your lunch. They're going into the garbage stream. That becomes food waste. Food waste kicks off methane. Methane is way stronger than carbon dioxide in terms of destroying the climate. So there's one small thing you could go. Get a meeting with your facilities team. Talk through the advantages of composting, what that might take at your company. Maybe it's energy efficiency. Maybe it's starting a climate club to get together with coworkers and talk about it. So I tried to put a lot of um, provocations and instigations. I have a list of about 40 things companies can add, whether it's you know just making a couple of the 401k fund choices, fossil fuel divested or otherwise climate positive. Uh, maybe it's cutting down on business travel. Maybe it's changing over your lighting to something more efficient. There is a lot everybody could be doing. And the great news is that these things would be not only a a PR boost, but, you know, don't greenwash. They're literally an HR boost because people want to feel like there's meaning at their company, meaning in their jobs. Wouldn't you rather your employees who who are Googling the web and thinking, oh, how do I get a climate job, come across this page and then turn back to you, their employer, and say, you know what, I'm going to make the job I have right now a climate job. What I find really great about what she's saying is that there's lots we can do that can actually help companies save money. And since cutting back on business travel is on her list, it's actually right in line with the current crisis measures with the coronavirus. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I keep saying that the silver lining, if if we can actually say that there's such a thing to a crisis like coronavirus, is that we really stop being complacent and rethink our day-to-day. I know that I've definitely changed my own habits around hygiene. I always wash my hands, I promise, <laughs> after going to the bathroom and handling raw meat and stuff. But now I've gotten into the habit of washing my hands after handling pretty much anything I'm unsure of, uh, even after touching a doorknob. Oh, yeah. And I never washed them for 20 seconds, I don't think. But now, <laughs> I, now I do. Uh, but, you know, we don't want to wait for a climate crisis to learn better habits. Definitely not. It's one thing to adjust behavior in crisis mode that will result in us going back more or less to normal day to day. Mm-hmm. Um, that's cool. I wash my hands more, touch my face less, and now I've learned better habits that will help prevent future illnesses and slow future outbreaks. And I hope others will do the same. Right. But I mean, it's different with coronavirus versus climate change. I mean, hopefully, because our consequences of our previous bad habits lead to bad outcomes like the flu spreading. But we can recover from this if we do the right thing and we stick to it going forward, washing our hands, not touching our faces. Easy enough to do, right? But a true climate crisis will have much more devastating and irreversible consequences. Absolutely. According to researchers at the World Health Organization, once again, who's dealing with a coronavirus, global warming is already responsible for some 150,000 deaths each year around the globe. And they estimate that it will double by 2030. And that's just from pollution. 
They estimate that an additional 5 million people get ill from climate change-related outcomes like spread of disease in mosquito populations and weather patterns like floods. So what happens when we enter a full-on crisis? I don't think I really want to (laughs) know. Neither do I. But I don't think we can just wash our hands and stay at home and it'll all get back to normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The reality is that public health or climate change or anything else that seems like an important thing to pay attention to but is an an immediate threat um, sort of takes a backseat to everything else we have going on in our lives. Yeah. So it could be a deadly virus. But could also be a really funny TikTok dance, (laughs) right? It seems like everything else wins out over paying attention to this long-term message. Mm -hmm. And the ironic part of all of this is that we can be complacent because of organizations like WHO and the Environmental Protection Agency because their job is to act like we're in a crisis every day so that the rest of us can enjoy ourselves on social media and watch those fun TikTok dance videos. And argue about ridiculous things that don't matter with people we don't know. Yes, Twitter fights. And buy stuff we don't need because it looks amazing on Instagram. Oh, Steph. Yes, Tara? I think we're part of the problem and the solution. What do you mean? (laughs) (laughs) Well, one of the things we haven't brought up is how I actually know Laura. Oh, that's right. You've been friends for a long time, yeah? Yeah, I met her back on Twitter in 2007, I think it was, we were both evangelizing social media and trying to get brands to get on board with it. She ended up writing Twitter for Dummies about the same time as I started writing The Woofy Factor. Then she founded a startup, and I founded a startup. Wait a minute. Am I copying her? Anyways, (laughs) now she's doing this work, and frankly, I admire her so much, but I'm also a bit nervous. Well, how so? Well, as I said before, we're... Uh, the royal we marketers mm-hmm. um, are part of the problem and the solution. Oh, I see. So you're envious because Laura is using her powers for good. Yeah, that with great power comes great responsibility thing. Well, don't beat yourself up. I mean, we're part of the solution too. Are we really? Yes, I think so. I mean, this week we invited Laura to be part of the podcast and we're helping her spread her message. And in our next podcast, we're hosting Anita Sarkeesian and her message is equally world changing and we're giving her a platform too. So I think we're doing lots. Yeah, that's that's true. And I do feel good about that. Thank you for the reminder. No problem. (laughs) By the way, let's make sure people know where to follow Laura and get that amazing information she's sharing. Yes. So as we mentioned, Laura is the founder of the Enough Company. So the website is enough.co. That's enough, E-N-O-U-G-H dot C-O. On her site, you'll find amazing resources for how to find a job in climate change, how you can make every job a job for climate change. So even if you're at a company right now and you want to make changes in your industry, It also has great resources about how your industry will be impacted and what you can do to mitigate that impact. There's other links and resources to guide you through the ways you can change your habits and how to invite Laura to come and help your business with this and much more. On the socials, as she would say, you can find the Enough Company pretty much everywhere as at Enough Company. Both words are fully spelled out. And Laura herself is at pistachio, like the nut. (laughs) We had a longer conversation in which she rattled off all sorts of great resources, podcasts, and apps. We will be sure to list all of them in the show notes. You can find those show notes wherever you're listening to this podcast, as well as on our website, truly, Mm T-R-U-L-Y-I-N-C dot com. And we'd love to send an enormous thank you to Laura for joining us. You've totally inspired us, Mm -hmm. uh, and you can consider us a part of your climate task force. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. And also to our content manager slash guest wrangler, Ammo Small, our audio engineer and editor, Joe Pacheco, and our incredible staff at Truly Inc. who help these stories come alive. The show is written and hosted by Tara Hunt and myself, Stephanie Forster. If you enjoyed this episode, there are many more like this to come. Subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Send us your feedback, ideas, suggestions, and yes, even your complaints on Twitter. We love fighting with people on the internet. (laughs) It's a good distraction. (laughs) Send me compliments, no complaints. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) The podcast is found at at Anatomy of a Strat. And I'm found at at Miss Rogue, R-O-G-U-E. And I'm found at Stephanie F. That's Stephanie, S-T-E-F-A-N-I-F. And also rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, please. And one more thing, share with your friends, colleagues, boss, family, anyone who you think would benefit 
from listening to this. See you soon. Bye. Hey there, Stefan Tara here again. We just wanted to pop in and give a quick temperature check. If you've been listening for a while, you may have noticed a bit of a format change here. What? Really? <laughs> just a little. Yeah, as Tara said, we're changing things up just a bit. So we used to sit down and have a freeform conversation. Then we just recorded the intro and outro and published it as it was a nice raw interview. Yeah, exactly. But when Steph came on board... It occurred to me that we could do better. There's a reason why we book these awesome guests, and it's not just so you can hear us ask them a series of questions. Many of these guests show up on other podcasts answering the same questions. Mm -hmm. So we thought we needed to create more of a story arc. So we wanted to provide context and kind of shape each episode a little more. We wanted to feature the guests, but we also want you, the audience, to get more out of listening. So our new format is... More like some of our favorite podcasts we listen to, like Radiolab, On the Media, Hidden Brain, and Planet Money, and such on. We're still featuring guests, but instead of just a free-form Q&A, we're highlighting the best bits of the conversation in a storyline that has a stronger point of view. I've wanted to do this for a while and generally do a bit of this in my follow-up blog posts where I embed the interview in some of the quotes, but I finally have the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a lot more work than just showing up with juicy questions, mm -hmm. but we really think it will be more valuable for you guys, the listeners. And also, this is our first kick at this, so don't be afraid to give us suggestions and how we can improve this new format. As we say in our new trailer, if you haven't heard it, it's available wherever you listen to podcasts. It's pretty short and sweet. We are all about exploring marketing thought. Yes. So this means we'll be diving into the multidisciplinary world that influences marketing strategies and practices. So this includes everything from cultural studies, social science, economics, linguistics, you name it. It incorporates our own approach to marketing, which is less about formulas and best practices and more about understanding audiences and the effects of world events. We hope you like it, though. If you don't, we're not going to go back to the previous format. We will just improve upon this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'd love to hear your feedback, so let us know. <laughs>